All right, we're going to take off and uh, descend into the stratosphere of ultrasound and come back down again, I hope. so. When I was an intern a long time ago, this is what we had for imaging. So we literally we didn't have CTs, MRIs, so you get a plain film x-ray, and if you're lucky, it showed something. It was good for bone, but anything soft tissue, back to the orbit, it just you weren't going to see much. Early generation CT scan, uh, just really, you know, better than x-rays, but uh, still really hard to tell detail, just not that refined. Ultrasound at that time was kind of a standard uh, of, of care, certainly for the globe, still is, but um, the orbit too, it was really the best we had to look at orbital uh, soft tissue, especially the anterior two-thirds of the orbit. But then this came along, so modern generation CT, MRI scanning, the detail, incredible muscles, nerves, everything, so who needs ultrasound, especially in the orbit? But there still is a place for it, which I'll try to show you. So basically, I use two modalities. One's the uh, V-scan, which you're kind of familiar with, and it's, you know, it's, it makes sense. It looks like shapes of things. If you take a cross-section of the eye, a funnel detachment with the T-sign here with the retina here, and fibrous membranes connecting the leaves together anteriorly, or a big melanoma mushrooming, so you know, really very good, and uh, we still use that all the time for uh, ocular processes. But the orbit uh, is a different area, and the A-scan is where I really use that a lot. And even though you know nothing about A-scan, you can see the difference. You can look at the normal orbit pattern here with A-scan and hemangioma, lymphoma, meningioma. So no much, uh, not so much what they actually represent right now, but it's more the difference. You can see the distinction between the different tissues. And there's a very direct tissue correlation between A-scan and, uh, and pathology. So, and that still is the case orbital lesions and also ocular lesions. So there's still a very important role for that. So basic principles, sound reflection from interfaces. So sound goes out, hits things, and bounces back again. We're not the first to think about this. A long time ago, Mother Nature did with bats, and that's how they fly around. So they emit sound at high frequency, hit uh, even small insects, and they can localize them and uh, attack them and eat them. So. Ultrasound is a very uh, old technology. Uh, ultrasound is defined as sound <coughs> above the range of human hearing. So we can hear in this range about the 20 kilohertz range is our, our ability to hear things. Dogs can hear up to 40, whales, dolphins, 70, and bats, 150. So we're still far below what we use for a diagnostic ultrasound. We're in the megahertz level. The standard probes that I use are the 8 to 10. We can go up to 50 or 60 with uh, UVM, so high frequency. So medical ultrasound, abdominal, uh, in this uh, range of frequency here, ophthalmic up to 60 as I mentioned. And we can do that because of the eye, the way it's structured. First of all, it's kind of a thin wall. The wall of the square is not very thick, so you can penetrate rather easily compared to the abdominal tissue, other parts of the body which are thicker and also the eyes full of fluid. So ultrasound tra travels readily through uh, fluid filled structures. So you can use that in the eye and get away with real high frequencies. The higher the frequency you get, the better resolution you get, but also the less penetration you get. So to go really deeply in tissues, you really can't use these high frequencies. That's why UVM can use real high frequencies. If you don't go very far back in the eye, you get the initial anterior uh, few millimeters of the eye before you lose uh, sound energy. Sound wave velocities, how fast does ultrasound travel? Well, the denser the media, the uh, faster it travels. So going through water, it's about 1480. Acreage vitreous, 1532, and that's where the standard uh, uh, velocity is set on our biometry instruments we use for ultrasound, soft tissue, uh, crystalline lens, and bone. So the uh, denser the tissue, the higher, the, the faster the sound velocity. I did a study a couple years ago on a thousand patients just to look at clinical correlation and uh, these are the results of the study which I'll address a little bit further but basically uh, the impression of the referring doctor he said this is a, probably a tumor probably a mubis or melanoma was confirmed in uh, about 400 of these patients no findings in 279 clinical impression 
altered or clarified in about a third of them, and incorrect diagnosis in five. So that was just results of a study that I did. So the basic principles, again, sound reflection from tissue interfaces, uh, B scan, brightness amplitude, the A scan is time amplitude, and I'll explain what well, that uh, means a bit more, and then UVM ultrasound by microscopy with high frequency immersion ultrasound. So the one equation for physics on an early Monday morning while you're still half asleep, acoustic impedance is equal to sound velocity times density. And this is the basic uh, uh, principle behind ultrasound. So the greater the difference in impedance between two media, the higher the A scan spike or the brighter the B scan image. So this is important. So ultrasound works by reflection from tissue interfaces. And the greater the difference between those interfaces, the sound velocity and density, the higher the spike on the A scan or the brighter the B scan pixel. An example here, this is a chordal hemangioma. So here's the tissue uh, lesion here, and this is a clinical photo of it. But these are very high reflective because there's a lot of interfaces. It's kind of like a honeycomb. As a sound beam goes through this, it hits a septa, spikes up, hits a blood lake, goes down, septa up, down. So this constant uh, interface uh, sound velocity uh, difference. So as you see going through the eye here, here's the A scan, so here's the vitreous. The vitreous is homogeneous, usually it's uh, you know, just a, a consistent media, so the sound just goes through it without much reflection, a little blip here or something. But as you hit the fundus, you suddenly change this impedance quality. You go from a sound velocity or one velocity to another, and uh, you get a high spike from the retina. And uh, once you're in the orbit, you get a lot of spikes because there's a lot of stuff in the orbit. You get blood vessels, muscles, septa, fat, so you get a lot of interfaces to reflect sound. And the correlate to the B scan is uh, darkness. So again, there's not much reflection inside the eye, so it's dark. Here's the vitreous cavity corresponding to a flat line on the A scan. Then once you hit something, you start getting reflection of sound. So the A scan displays that as spikes, the B scan as bright dots. So this hemangioma is quite high reflective because there's a lot of interfaces. You get a bright lesion on the B scan and a high reflective on the A scan. So the actual lesion is from there to there. So that's all inside the lesion. And it's quite high reflective because of the uh, reflection of the tissue. And this is important because this is really very diagnostic. I can look at this and tell you almost all the time that's what it is. It's a hemangioma and not a melanoma, not something else. So there's a real good correlation to pathology. So B-scan brightness amplitude. So the B-scan probe um, is, looks like this, and there's a marker on it, and that marker is important because that tells you which way the uh, transducer is oscillating. So it kind of oscillates in one plane, and that, where you point the marker, tells you which way it's oscillating. And that's important for localization of uh, structures, and I'll discuss that a bit more. So the B-scan, if you take off the uh, tip, you see this transducer, and this is going to go back and forth about 15 to 20 seconds, times a second. So you get this scanning of the eye, and as you point, uh, you go across the eye, you look at different quadrants of it. Each scan gets about 60 degrees of the surface of the uh, inside the eye, so you can go around the eye and uh, look at the entire eye in about six different sections to get through 60 degrees. And uh, this is what a B-scan picture looks like. Here's an axial scan going with the probe right against the cornea. And this is called the dead zone. When you put the probe against the eye, you lose information right in this area here because that's kind of where the sound is reflecting and pick, being picked up by the same uh, transducer picks it up and sends the sound. So it's called the dead zone. So you really can't get much information there. That's why we use immersion techniques to back the probe off to be able to see structures in that dead zone area. So when you're right against the eye, right in here is the cornea somewhere, the anterior chamber is in there, in front of the lens, so you really don't get much information. Once you get past that, then you're inside the eye. So here's iris, here's the back of the lens here, and going through the eye here, here's the optic nerve. So this is a B-scan picture. Examination techniques, as I mentioned, the marker on the probe is important because that tells you which way the, uh, the beam is rotating, if the transducer is rotating. So by definition, when you have the marker this way, kind of in the plane of the slide here, 
this is parallel to the limbus. So here's the limbus here, and you're going back and forth in the plane of, of, of the picture. That's called a transverse position. So when you're ever parallel to the limbus, wherever you are in the limbus, if you're parallel to it, that's called transverse. If you're perpendicular, so if you rotate it this way, so here's a marker up here, and you're going this way with the transducer, that's called a longitudinal position. So here's a limbus here, and you're perpendicular to it. So longitudinal transverse <coughs> are two major propositions that we use. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's important because when <coughs> you look at tumors and things, you want to be able to characterize the different dimensions of the tumor. And that really translates clinically to practical use because we do plaques all the time. We plaque radioact uh, radioactive plaques, and red red iodine for melanomas. You want to be able to tell the uh, the maker of the plaque, what size to make the plaque when you put it on the eye to kill the tumor. So those dimensions are important. That's the ones that I do when I measure these for uh, the retina guys. Here's an axial scan right against the cornea. You're going through the eye here. Axial scan, I don't like quite as much uh, because a couple reasons. First of all, patients are more squeamish to put their fur right directly on the eye. They're more comfortable putting off to the side. And also you lose information as you go through the lens. You get some sound absorption. You don't get as much information from the sound by going directly, by, except by bypassing the lens. So that's why I prefer other positions besides axial, but I use this occasionally for certain things. So here's an example again. So putting the probe here, this is an axial view going through the eye here. Again, here's the back of the lens, posterior lens. You're losing information up in this area of the cornea and anterior chamber. And here's a small tumor, so you can see this. Uh, this would be superior to the optic nerve. Here's the optic nerve shadow, and here's the lesion just above that you're capturing. But it's, you know, it's kind of attenuated. You're losing information from the sound because it's being absorbed by the lens. So that's why axial isn't the perfect view for this. Again, so transverse. So again, you're parallel to the limbus, going this way with the, with the beam. So sweeping across the eye in this direction, kind of the anterior to posterior direction. And here's the longitudinal view. You're going uh, superior to inferior. So if you had a lesion in this area, you're going to scan it both directions, this way here and this way here are the two major ways. You can also do it you know, obliquely in diff different views, but these are the two major that we use to characterize lesions and to uh, tell the uh, information for the plaque making. So here's a transverse view. Again, so you're sweeping the plane of the, of the slide. Here's the lesion here, so you go across the lesion this way, and then it displays it on this way. And the way the software is made on these machines, it always displays um, where, the pro where the marker is on the probe, that's displayed as up on the screen. So wherever you point your marker, that will just display it as up. So if you're, in this case, the marker is towards us here, and so the lesion is here, so this is just, it just rotates it, and you have to kind of think three dimensionally when it shows it, that the lesion is always up. So you can turn the marker inferiorly, you're going to see the lesion on, that, on the screen as being up. So you just have to think in those terms. Longitudinal B-scan, again, here you're going perpendicular to the limbus, so you're right here, and you're sweeping across the lesion this way, showing the lesion in this direction here. So those two views of lesion, you get a transverse view and a perpendicular view, a longitudinal view. Again, it shows it here clinically. So this would be what kind of a scan here with the probe here? The markers up here. Longitudinal or transverse? Transverse. Transverse because you're parallel to the limbus, right? And here's the lesion here. We're showing this lesion at 3 o'clock. So you're going across the eye. So here's the probes over here going through the vitreous. The lesion's here nasally. So you display it here as, as the lesion. It's pretty centered. It's right almost directly at 3 o'clock. So the lesion just pops up there right in the plane of the, of the, of the uh, probe. This view is longitudinal because, again, you're perpendicular. The marker is this way. You're, you're perpendicular to the limbus, showing the lesion in this direction. So those two views of the lesion. And again, this is a, this is a 3 o'clock. And you kind of put those together. So again, you've done your, your transverse view here, going sweeping this way across the lesion. You've done longitudinal this way, going this way across the lesion. And you show those two views of lesion. And you kind of get a good characterization of the uh, base of the lesion, how, how, uh, how wide it is. For thickness measurements, you can use B-scan for that, but there's always, it's not real accurate, because you try to measure from the tip there. You know, so where is the choroid in there? You kind of get the shadowing effect from lesions. So 
So A scan is actually more accurate to measure, so I usually use both. I'll do an A scan thickness measurement, and I'll do a B scan dimensional measurement. So those are the ones that I usually do. And I mentioned the A scan, so again, the probe is here against the sclera, the dead zone here, just like the B scan, this information here is lost because you're right against the, uh, the, the eye, so about three to five millimeters here. You're in the sclera here, you're in the, the parts plana, vitreous area. So you lose that information, it doesn't really show you anything. You go across the vitreous cavity, and again, the vitreous is, uh, is low baseline because there's no reflection inside vitreous normally unless you have something in the vitreous. You hit the lesion, you get a difference in impedance going across the sound velocity changes. You get a high spike from the surface of the tumor. Then once you're inside, it uh, depends on the structure of the lesion. So based on pathology, if there's a lot of interfaces, how dense they are, you know, what size, the portion of size they are, all that information is inside this. So that really helps characterize lesions. Um, and as, when you hit the back of the, uh, of the eye here, the sclera, and you're back in the orbit. So the actual lesion is from there to there. And this shows the uh, distinction here. Here's a melanoma, rather densely cellular uh, population of cells few blood vessels, a few interfaces, but they're really pretty homogeneous tissue, just like the vitreous. So if you go through the vitreous here, you hit the surface of the tumor right there, and then you're inside the lesion. And this is quite low. Here's the sclera, here's the tumor, so there's a lesion from there to there. You're back in the orbit over here. But that reflectivity is usually quite low because these are really homogeneous, dense lesions. Most melanomas are in this range from about here up to about here, and that really helps. That reflectivity height tells you a lot about the lesion. Also regularity, how regular the structure is, and also vascularity, which I'll show you in a couple minutes, uh, a picture of that or a video. So that's the A scan of this lesion. And again, the B scan, the vitreous here. Here's the actual lesion, this little this mound raising up here. They're often kind of mushrooming appearance as they break through butch membrane. They'll kind of pop through and have a, have a narrow neck. It's called a uh, collar button or mushroom effect. And the retina's being pushed off right here. But you can see the correlation on the A and the B scan. And the A-scan probe uh, looks like this, kind of like a pencil, thinner than the B-scan probe. And there's no mark on this probe because it doesn't really matter. The sound beam is generated by the transducer uh, in all directions. It doesn't sweep like the B-scan uh, probe does. So there's no marker just to orient you. It's just a, just a single sound beam coming out in a wave. Now there's often a source of confusion about A-scan. This is often even the reps, if you go to the academy and walk through the displays and things, look at the instruments, they often will tell you our instrument has, a B, has, has an A scan to it. Well, in their mind, A scan is the same as biometry. Biometry probes are an A scan modality. But I use a separate, dedicated diagnostic A scan probe. And it's really important because you can't do uh, what I do with tumors and things with a biometry A scan probe. It doesn't work. I can do biometry with this probe. I can do it all the time. I do an emergency technique where I can use this A scan to actually measure the length of the eye. I do that. But you can't go the other way and take a, a biometry A-scan probe, which most machines come with, and do tumor work and things like that for quantitation. So it's, it's different reflection of sound, it's different lens imaging, focusing, things like that. So that's the difference. So it's important to know that. So if you ever buy a machine and you're trying to get an A-scan, uh, reps often confuse that. But it's a separate probe, and there's also a lot of B-scan units have called a vector A-scan. If you look at, turn the B-scan on, at the bottom there's kind of this A-scan uh, signal. I rarely ever use that. Sometimes I use it for like a staphyloma, trying to line up the vector with the, uh, with the staphyloma to do a measurement. But really, it's, otherwise it's not useful. The information from there just doesn't correlate to what we get with standardized A-scan. So it's got to be a separate A-scan probe, a separate software, and that adds cost. That's more expensive, but it really, to do complete ultrasound, that's what I need to do. We have those machines here at Moranis where we use all the time. We're trying to get one for the VA one of these days. So, so returning echoes, so what influences what the ultrasound looks like on the, on the display? Absorption of sound, we talked about that. So I go through the lens, that's again why axial scans are really good, they could be absorbed by, uh, by, the, by the tissue. Reflection of sound, just like light, the same optic, uh, equations apply to sound waves. So Snell's law, things like that, reflection, uh, angle of incidence, angle of, uh, of uh, direction. 
interfaces, size, shape, smoothness, these all influence what the sound wave looks like when you get reflections on the uh, A and the B scan. Being perpendicular is really important uh, when you do biometry. Again, we're doing more and more IL masters, so probably don't think about these things, but you're still going to have occasions to have to do ultrasound, like the text here. I, the last I heard was about 10% or so, probably a little better with modern units, but they still need to do immersion A scan on cataract patients. Real dense cataracts, dense PSCs, IL master just doesn't work as, as well. They can't get reading, so we still use ultrasound a lot. And being perpendicular is really important to do biometry, but also to measure lesions also. So here's a lesion, you're going through the vitreous here. Here's the first surface of the lesion, here's the sclera, so the actual lesion is right in there. And if you're not perpendicular, this is the same lesion just by angling the probes. I wasn't perpendicular, I get this. So here's the surface of the lesion, but inside, reflectivity patterns are different. You'd hear, you call this kind of a medium to low reflection. Here it looks like it's higher. So that can deceive you. So by not being perpendicular, you can get spurious both measurements of things and also internal structure is, uh, is skewed by that. So really being perpendicular is important. How do you know you're perpendicular? Well, you get a real high spike. When it's real high and tall like that, as tall as the initial spike, that means you're perpendicular by definition. If you start to angle the probe away from that, this kind of drops off, so you're less perpendicular. You don't get as high as a nice uh, rising spike there, so that's the difference. So indications uh, for ultrasound, opaque media, obviously you can't see inside the eye. Um, uh, that's the reason to do ultrasound. Medical legally, there have been a number of cases of dense cataracts removed and they found a tumor hiding behind the cataract. And that's not good to have that happen. And certainly the patient's not happy because they don't have great vision. But there's also probably some risk of doing surgery in an eye with a tumor that you know you might disseminate tumor. So you need to know beforehand uh, what's behind the cataract. So opaque media, visible fundus lesions, you know you can see the lesion, the accuracy rate. Um, to know what they actually are, even with really good people that do a lot of this, it's probably 80% in that range to actually tell what it is by looking at it. So ultrasound really enhances that ability to diagnose. Biometry, you mentioned axial length, measurement of uh, structures inside the eye, tumors and things, vitreoretinal pathology and optic disc abnormality. It's just kind of the major things that I think ultrasound is useful for. And again, there's a niche here with, with uh, retina issues and things like that, with even with MRI, CT scanning. You still can do a lot with ultrasound to fill those gaps in. So opaque media. So again, the dense cataracts. Uh, uh, one of the studies uh, years ago stated that uh, patients with a blind, painful eye, for whatever reason, about 10% will harbor unsuspected melanomas. So it's you know pretty high. So um, you have to always think thinking about. Now, if you follow the patient, this is your patient, you watched them as the cataract developed and grew, the odds of that are pretty small, but have a patient walk in the clinic the first time, no history, you know, old trauma, whatever's gone on, and their eye hurts and it's, and it's opaque, that has a pretty good chance of having something behind that, so definitely ultrasound's indicated. So the patients that I saw in the study that I mentioned, about a third had pathology not suspected by the doctor. So they sent to me with a dense cataract or a cloudy cornea, whatever. I found something inside the eye that hadn't realized was there. So whether it was vitreous hemorrhage, detached retina, uh, whether it was a tumor, you know, those things. So I guess it's important, uh, at least a third of patients are gonna have something unsuspected when they walk in the, the door and have opaque media. Visible fundus lesions, differentiation, um, so to look at something and tell what it is, you know, really, even if you're good and do a lot of this, you can still be deceived by these lesions. And there were two large past studies, one back in the 60s by Fond and Ferry out of AFIP. And they looked at all the eyes submitted that had been nucleated. In those days, nucleation was really more common. When I trained at uh, UCLA, uh, patients uh, walked in the door with a suspected melanoma, even a small one. They were often nucleated within the same week, like almost like emergency procedure. And unfortunately, about a fifth of these had benign lesions. And they had 20-20 vision, so you know, not great to have that kind of kind of result. So, um, and this this past study verified that the AFIP looked at all these eyes and nucleated in the 60s, and that that was with you know techniques of examination at that time, indirect ophthalmoscopy, fluorescent angiography, 
and they found that about a fifth had false uh, positive. And that was repeated in the 70s, the same study, looked at, again, eyes of the AFIP, they found the same result, 20%. So uh, ultrasound already has changed that equation. We're up in the 99.7% accuracy rate with the collaborative ocular mental study that was done a few years ago. So it's changed that. So to look at a lesion, you know, is that a nevus, is that a melanoma, you know, what's what? Uh, you really, just by looking, it's really hard to tell unless you do an ultrasound. So biometry, axial length I mentioned. Um, we use immersion techniques where we put a shell between the lids and stand the probe back. And that way you don't have this dead zone I mentioned. So here's actually the dead zone here from the probe itself, the, the physics of the probe reverberation. Get this dead zone, but then once you're past that, you're going through the shell here, hitting the cornea. So here's the cornea spike. You're going through the anterior chamber here. Here's anterior lens, posterior lens, vitreous, and retina. So you can separate out the different tissues and uh, distinguish them again with immersion uh, ultrasound. Measuring lesions. Here's a lesion I saw years ago. There's a B scan of this little lip right here, this little, uh, looked like a probably nevus, nevoma sort of thing. And over time, it didn't seem to change that much. It looked about the same as far as the height. And the A scan right here looked about the same as far as the thickness, but you actually see change in reflectivity. You can see it pretty high here. See how it's starting to get lower here? Well, change to getting lower usually means it's getting more homogeneous. It's going from a nevus, nevoma situation to more of a melanoma. As they get more homogeneous, denser cells, reflectivity starts to just uh, get lower, like we talked about before. The denser a structure is, the more homogeneous, the more, uh, the flatter the ultrasound is, or the lower it is. So it really helped us in this case to know it was actually, even though it looked like about the same size, it was actually changing uh, pathology of characteristics and getting more aggressive. So we watched it more carefully and actually grew more and had to have the eye nucleated uh, after, uh, uh, I mean not nucleated, but uh, uh, plaque, radiation plaque. Retinal pathology, so classic uh, funnel detachment, serpiginous structure, or it can be uh, uh, fixed uh, folds or more uh, fluid folds. And then the A scan shows a real high spike. And sometimes it's hard to tell on B scan, you see these membranes, especially like vitreous hemorrhage, diabetics, trauma. There's a lot going on inside the eye, you know, is it retina, is it not? But the A scan can be helpful because if you see a real high spike on A scan, it usually is retina. And even though it's a dense vitreous membrane, you won't get that high as you scan the eye and look at different membranes. You'll see membranes in this area here, but you get that real high spike, that's very suggestive of retina. So if I see that, I, I lean more towards retina compared to a vitreous membrane. So it can be helpful to do the A scan in those cases where you're not sure. It shows different configurations of, of detached retinas. Here's kind of a shallow one. But attaches the optic nerve, you always look for that. You find it on the optic nerve shadow, and then you look and see if there's an attachment of the membrane there. Again, that's more suspicious for retinas, not diagnostic. You can have a dead vitreous membrane that still attaches at the optic disc, but it's still, uh, you see that with a high A scan spike, that's almost always going to be retina. Here's kind of an interesting affinity pattern uh, on the long standing de detachment with cystics inside the retina, retinal cyst. It's kind of an interesting pattern there. This is supposed to play, but it just somehow never works on my...
Now, what I'll do is I'll hook up my laptop after this and show you some uh, kinetics. I have it on that, it'll play. Anyways, when I show this, it'll actually show the movement of these different membranes. This is a case of a vitreous hemorrhage, and you'll see the kinetics of it versus uh, retina detachment and other things. There's a small melanoma uh, right here with an overlying retinal detachment. It just shows the top membrane versus the more fluid membrane of a vitreous uh, membrane. And here's a melanoma. Here's a retina detachment over it. Here's a vitreous hemorrhage, just kind of fluid flow as the eye moves. I'll try to show all those to you with my, on my laptop. And the A scan shows a high spike here, and again, actually has movement of the A scan. There's a little wiggle of the A scan that goes along with the membrane versus a solid lesion. So, indication, vitreous pathology, optic dysmembermalities. So, this is a very common thing we see in clinic, you know headaches, especially a younger person and women, teenage years, headache key and they have these funny looking discs. Everybody gets nervous and sends them to the neurologist and get MRI, CTs, angiograms, whatever else, $25,000 workout. You can do this in about five seconds to see the drusen popping out at you there. And sometimes it's obvious, sometimes you can see the drusen just looking at the disc. You'll see these little refractile bodies on the surface of the disc which go along with the dense uh, this drusen. But sometimes they're not so obvious, sometimes they're more buried. They can actually look like pathodema. They can look pretty scary sometimes. But again, by doing the ultrasound, you can see the bright uh, refractions from the, the uh, drusen. Another one here, very uh, looking like pathodema, but again, the bright uh, refraction. Now, sometimes it's not drusen. This is an example here where the A scan can be helpful. Here's a, a swollen looking nerve here. But the B scan doesn't show any bright uh, uh, refractile bodies. So you see just a normal uh, uh, optic disc appearance here, but you see a little, little bulge of it there, so it is this elevated disc. But the A scan actually quantitated it. So here was the left eye, so this was the normal eye. So right here is the surface of the optic nerve, here's the other side. So the actual nerve thickness was right there, which is pretty normal, it's like two and a half or something. But here's a thickened optic nerve from there to there, so rather thick. And as you have the patient look to the side three degrees, it actually thins out. It's called a 30 degree test. You may hear that in ophthalmology as you go through it. And as the patient looks straight ahead, you measure the nerve, then you have them look 30 degrees to the side, abduct the eye, and actually thin the nerve out. Because the theory is as you stretch the nerve, the fluid kind of distributes and thins the nerve out. You watch this thing just kind of thin down as they look to the side. So it can be helpful to distinguish a swollen nerve from a, a pseudo uh, pamphlodema situation. Uh, here was a case, uh, so Reese, what is this? You look at this patient walks in, sudden loss of vision, just right first gut reaction, pattern artery recognition. Vision. What's that? Thick and artery. Yeah, central retinal artery, check that cherry red spot, macula just stands out because it's the edema around it and just makes it look more prominent. And this is a box carrying. If you'd like you to see this fast enough, you see the little the, uh, red cells actually get kind of move along just like little box cars, just like a train going by because they're all clumped together. Here's the fluorescing, the same thing. But this shows a difference. So this case, I looked with the V scan, and there was a uh, embolus right at the optic nerve, right at the central retinal artery. And this is the drusen. <coughs> you can see the difference. The drusen is more anterior, the anterior to the lamina cribosa, whereas this is posterior to it. So these are more posterior. So about a third of the time, one of the studies uh, by Sir got out of uh, Wills, then about a third of these patients, the central and artery occlusions likely to have a uh, demonstrable embolus on V scan. So it's worth doing that. You know, if you're in the five o'clock Friday night situation, you're on call, you've got a V scan handy, just look for that. If you see that right away, you know what it is. It's an embolus causing that. This patient went on to have uh, CT angiography and showing the uh, blockage here and also right in this area here. 
So color Doppler, um, I do some of this. We don't really have that capacity here. It's over in the main hospital, but that's our kind of our goal. So these are Doppler units, which is used for you know, general ophthalmology, I mean general uh, uh, ultrasound, looking at uh, uh, vascular occlusions and things, uh, venous thrombosis, carotid arteries, things like that, but also it can be adapted for the orbit. So the Doppler effect, change in uh, frequency of the sound wave caused by movement of a reflector. Kind of stand on the train tracks and the train comes towards you, here it blows the whistle and goes past you, you hear a different change in the pitch of the whistle. That's the Doppler effect. Same thing using astronomy for the Big Bang theory about the blue red ship. Anyway, a color Doppler in the orbit can be helpful for blood flow. So here's a normal color Doppler. So the eyeball's up here. Uh, your optic nerves down this area here, and this shows uh, red is arterial flow, uh, blue is venous flow. This is a normal looking Doppler. Here's the central retinal artery over here. I'm not sorry, the ophthalmic artery, central retinal artery here, carotid vessels here. But you can see this distribution of blood flow, just nice and healthy looking. Here is a hemi artery occlusion. See the half is just wiped out. So here's the half that's normal. This half is gone. So the blood flow is blocked by a small embolus sitting up there. Here's the giant solar deritis, and these just wipe out the orbit. It's just kind of like a dead orbit. They're really, every, all the blood flows blocks. These are really just kind of, that's why they lose vision so rapidly and so profoundly, because they just have total occlusion of the blood flow to the orbit from the giant cell. That's why they're so dangerous. You've got to treat them right away, save the other eye. Uh, I don't mention the embolus before, so here's an embolic plaque here, again, behind the lamina verbosa up here. Right there. Orbital venous flow. Here's a normal superior ophthalmic vein. This, uh, kind of a nice venous pattern right there as you look superiorly. And here's a patient with a, a fistula. So in the arterialization of the venous flow it becomes red, bluish, kind of mixed. It's very uh, high, uh, high flow situation. We can actually measure flow with color Doppler and get. Uh, the uh, flow rate is a lot faster in these. Tumor vasculature, you can use this to look at tumors and look at blood flow inside tumors. I don't usually do that, I just put the A and the B scan, I can usually see kinetics with that. UBM, this is my days at UCLA, we used to do it this way, it's a form of torture. You drape the whole face, fill it full of water, and the patients love that, and just like they were scuba diving. Put the probe inside, so <coughs> things. We're not, not more humane now with these little shells and things we use, covers on the tip. Uh, high immersion, you can go again. The standard probe is 10 megahertz. This is a 20 megahertz, so here's a here's kind of a peripheral view of a tumor with the uh, B scan. But if you put immersion scan shell on and look at it here, you can see the tumor much better. This is a dictyoma. 50 megahertz, get these beautiful pictures, corneas up here, here's the iris, there's the ciliary body, there's the lens, you see some zonules down here, some it's really high mag uh, pictures of the front of the eye. There's iris cysts, we see these uh, not uncommonly. So you can see there's multiple cysts that are pushing the iris forward. Here's a case we had uh, years ago with Alba Tally, this kind of a chronic endophthalmitis after uh, cataract surgery several years out, kind of a chronic inflammation kept coming back in spite of treatment. We looked at the UVM, and here's the IOL. You see a plaque stuck right to the IOL. This is the acne uh, plaque growing there on the surface of the limb. And here's a case of the UGG syndrome, uveitis, hyphema, glaucoma, chronic uh, inflammation after cataract surgery. Here's a haptic here. As you get closer, as you follow it, actually touches the uh, iris and rubs on the iris and causes this chronic inflammation. So nice way to demonstrate that. Case I saw not too long ago of a, during the cataract surgery, the, the, probably the tip, of the echo tip, uh, hits an instrument inside the eye, a little burst of particles flew off, and I'm got stuck to the lens right there. You can see that causing kind of a chronic inflammation. And here's a case of a uh, uh, cyclodialysis a patient had a trauma, so our body is just attached completely and causing hypotony. Is, uh, here's a neurodialysis again showing just the breakthrough here for the iris separated. This shows a different uh, same lesion here. This is a cystic lesion with the 10 megahertz standard ultrasound with immersion. 
There's a 20 megahertz and here's a 50, just showing the resolution we can get with these higher frequencies. <coughs> Study by Shields, I copied this out of one of the journals. Um, interesting, showing the versus OCT versus UVM. OCT is great in the anterior chamber. You just get great resolution. You start getting behind the iris though. You really can't see behind the iris. That's the problem with the light-based technology like OCT versus ultrasound. So you see a bulge in the iris here, but here's the actual lesion behind it. Here's a bulge, here's the lesion, bulge, lesion. So you just can't see these unless you do the UVM. You can see the iris bulging forward on the front surface, but you can't see what's behind it. Again, a number of cases, again, the same thing, large lesion here. So you can just see how much you can miss without doing the UVM. So it really is important. And he thought about iris pathology or somebody body, you have to do these. So we're descending now, so hopefully I can get this video to play to show you the kinetics. a uh, attached retina with some vitreous hemorrhage and you can see as the eye moves you get that stiff movement it's just stiff it doesn't really flow freely like a vitreous membrane would so again, the stiffness of that membrane versus the fluid <coughs> nature of the vitreous so you can see the difference and it attaches there at the optic disc <coughs> that tumor but this is the vitreous this is the attached retina over it you can see as the eye moves it just kind of that taut like you know you tighten a, a rope or a string and twing it whereas the vitreous stuff really is just moving very fluidly Cast retina over it, just very stiff, just not fluid moving. see the fluid movement of the vitreous, the posterior hyaline face with some vitreous hemorrhage, just kind of that very flowing motion compared to that stiff movement of a retina. So kinetics are helpful, so when I see a membrane like this and you're not sure if it's retina versus vitreous, I do a number of things. I look at uh, reflectivity on both A and B scan. I look at movements, kinetics, I try to follow it out because often vitreous membranes will not, they kind of disappear as you follow them peripherally, they get weaker and weaker, whereas retina detachments stay strong all the way to the periphery, so those are things that I kind of watch. And the vitreous hemorrhage again, this is a dense membrane here, but it's again very fluid as the eye moves, it just kind of flows, it just, it's not that stiff movement like a detached retina. So a posterior hyaloid phase can be rather dense. As they get uh, blood deposits on them over time, they will get kind of dense, and B uh, scan look like a detached retina. But again, by the movement of the, uh, of the B scan kinetics and also the A scan reflectivity, you can rule out detached retina versus a vitreous. This is actually a tumor, but there's blood over it. You can just see the blood just kind of flowing. This is it kind of moves. It just kind of flows under the retina, under the detached uh, uh, hyaloid face. I'm sorry, the retina's not detached. So again, kinetics are helpful. I do this a lot. Uh, look at these membranes that uh, are deceiving. 
You can also actually see blood flow on the, uh, I'll discuss this a bit more tomorrow, I'm talking about a bit more about tumors, but you can, I'll just show it I've got it here quickly. So the A scan, I look internally, there's a lot of movement going on here. This is really this rapid flicker inside, just that really rapid, spontaneous flicker, consistent with blood flow. here of the B scan. This rapid little internal flicker to see it inside the lesion, just this flickering little like starry night, stars in the sky at night, just kind of flickering. So again, it's very helpful to see that with real time because not many things do that except melanomas. It's just that rapid flicker inside the lesion. Okay, so that's it. It's kind of an overview of what we can do with ultrasound, A, B scan, Doppler, UBM. So there you go. See you tomorrow.